So <coughs> you do there. <coughs> so the day of the feast of Saint Januarius and the great saint of Italy of Naples. And uh, so and it's good to be back here in New Hampshire because it's been a while since the last time I was here. And uh, so try to make sure it's not so long a gap next time. And uh, I'm not going to read the Epistle and Gospel for today, but rather from the breviary, the life of Saint, uh, uh, the martyrdom of St. Januarius. Januarius was Bishop of Beneventum in the period when Diocletian and Maximian were venting their cruelty against the Christians. He was brought before Timotheus, governor of Campania at Nola, charged with professing the Christian faith. There his constancy was assailed in many ways. He was cast into a seething furnace, from which he, he emerged unharmed, neither his garments nor a hair of his head singed by the flames. This so enraged the governor that he ordered the martyr's body to be racked until every sinew, every joint was broken, and his limbs were torn apart. Meanwhile, Festus, his deacon, and Desiderius, a reader, a lector, were arrested, chained, and together with the bishop, dragged before the governor's chariot to Pozzuoli. There they were thrown into the same prison, where there were confined two other deacons, so Socius and Mycenaeum, and Proculus and, uh, of, of Pozzuoli, and two laymen, Eudices and Acutius, all condemned to the beasts. When, on the following day, Januarius and his six companions were thrown to the beasts in the amphitheater, the animals, forgetting their natural ferocity, fawned at the feet of Januarius, Timotheus, attributing uh, 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 Januarius, Timotheus, attributing this to some trick of magic, was pronouncing the death sentence, and on the witnesses for Christ, on the witnesses for Christ when he was suddenly stricken blind. He was destroyed by the prayers of the blessed Januarius, a miracle which caused about 5,000 men to embrace the Christian faith. But the ungrateful judge, far from being softened by the favor conferred upon him, was so infuriated by the multitude of conversions and so completely subservient to the emperor's decree that he ordered the holy bishop and his companions to be put to death. The neighboring towns, each eager to secure for itself among the martyrs a patron before God, provided tombs for their bodies. The Neapolitans, in response to a heavenly warning, took the body of Januarius. They buried it first at Beneventum and then in the monastery of Monte Vergine. Finally, it was translated to Naples and placed in the principal church where it became famous for many miracles. One of the most memorable of these was stopping the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, when the map mountain flamed and cast forth molten lava, striking terror to the neighboring towns and far distant districts. Another remarkable miracle takes place even in our own day, whenever the blood of the martyr, which is preserved, congealed in a glass vial, is brought into proximity with his head, it liquefies and bubbles in a remarkable way, as if it had been freshly shed. So they were reading from the breviary of the, the martyrdom of St. Januarius. And today a few considerations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Januarius is the great disciple or great um, uh, apostle or great uh, uh, patron of the city of Naples. And every year, every year from that time of his death, the time of Diocletian, 305 A.D., or three, about 302 A.D. when he was martyred, until this year, every year on this feast day, the blood of Januarius is brought before his head, and sometime during the day it congeals, it liquefies. However, on some years, some years it does not liquefy. And in whatever year it does not liquefy, some great tragedy follows, falls upon the city of Naples, 
One year when it didn't liquefy was the year of the invasion of the Goths and Visigoths, and the city was sacked. Another year when it didn't liquefy, there was a great plague killing many people in the city. And so on this day in Naples, even to this very day, this very year, the Neapolitans gather at the, at the tomb of, uh, at, the, at the altar of St. Januarius, the Catholics and the pagans all gather together, and they all pray, Januarius, Januarius, you know, we, we love you, we pray to you, please congeal the blood. And sometimes it congeals early in the day, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes in the evening. And if Januarius delays, they began to curse and say, we don't like you anymore, you must, you know, you must uh, congeal the blood. Uh, the Neapolitans are very much like New Yorkers, or the Italian version of New Yorkers. And uh, so they're very difficult people. And they can continue to, to, to complain. And if the blood does not congeal, then something tragic happens every single one of those years. It happens rarely, but this miracle takes place every single year from 302 AD until now, 2015. And so I don't know if the blood congealed today or not, but if it didn't, there will be a great tragedy that will come upon the city of Naples during the course of the next year. But today, the considerations on the martyrdom of Januarius and the mystery of the faith in general. And so, so then, you know that um, Januarius is put to death by an emperor, or not by a, 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 not an emperor, but one of the magistrates below the emperor. And this governor who puts him to death, first he has Januarius put into the boiling, he's put into a furnace, not a boiling oil, but into a furnace. He's burnt inside of a furnace. When he comes out of the furnace, he is not hot, he is not singed, he doesn't even have a hair of his head harmed, and he has not experienced the least bit of discomfort. So after roasting him in the furnace, he comes out, and there's a miraculous being saved. Very similar to the three young men in the fiery furnace. He came out and he was not harmed. What happens? The governor does not convert. He becomes more angry. And then, then he, can, he commands that he be fed to the wild beasts. But before this is done, he wants to make sure that he really suffers. And therefore the fire would not burn him. So he gets the soldiers. And they break apart each of his sinews. And they pull his bones apart. And they cut him in every part of his body so that he is completely wounded or he cannot walk or move. Then he is taken and thrown into the wild beasts in the amphitheater so that everyone can watch Januarius die, along with his six companions. The animals come out, the lions come out, and they lick the feet of Januarius. And the lions come and put themselves fawning at the feet of Januarius and acting like little kittens rather than great lions. And therefore, the governor says, governor, his name is Timotheus, Timotheus says, this is done by a trick of magic. And he becomes more angry, more angry. So then, therefore, he commands that, when he became, that he be put to death. And when he makes that command, that the soldiers come out of their, their, uh, into the amphitheater and kill Januarius in the presence of all the, five, uh, the thousands of witnesses in the amphitheater, he is immediately struck blind. And he cries that he's blind. And all the people, the thousands of people inside of the amphitheater recognize that the, the Timotheus, the governor, is struck blind when he declared the death of Januarius. Januarius recognizes that Timotheus is blind. Therefore, he feels sorry for him. And he prays. And by the prayer of Januarius, the governor's blindness is taken away. And when these thousands and thousands of people in the amphitheater see the blindness of, Janu of, Tim of Timotheus taken away, 5,000 men convert in that crowd. And when they convert and say they now believe that the God of Januarius is a true God, that Jesus Christ is the true God, and that these are true warriors of the true God, and they're going to follow that true God unto death, many of them will be martyred. Timotheus becomes more angry, more angry, and he does not repent. He does not convert. And therefore he commands that they be put to death. And here we see one of the mysteries of the grace of God. God gives His grace. You know that we often say, well, why? how can anyone not convert when they see the truth? How can anyone not convert when they see the miracle of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe? When they see that here is an image that is 500-year-old cloth that can only last for only 40 years maximum, and there's a miraculous image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, upon this image. There's no painting on it in the eyes of the eyes of a living woman. They are the living eyes. 
that reflect exactly as our eyes reflect only alive. And so clearly this is a miracle. Who could not believe that? Who could not believe that the God of Bernadette, who made her body incorrupt while she's taking a nap in Nevers in France, after 150 years, 180 years now being in the grave, and yet she is completely incorrupt, and her body is as fresh as the moment that it died, and she is completely at peace and no decay. And the same with all the other miraculous hosts, and the miraculous uh, bodies of the saints all throughout the world who are incorrupt. And the miracle of the sun, in which the sun danced in 1917. And so many other miracles. The great miracle itself of the resurrection. And all the miracles of Christ. How can it be that someone can see the truth, see the evidence of the truth, have an undeniable facing of the truth, and see even the miraculous conversion or, or, or correction of themselves, and yet not convert? Our Lord Himself said, and many men I say unto you, until the very end of the world, not every city in this Israel shall be evangelized. He walked through all of Israel. He told his apostles to walk through Israel. And they've walked through it for 2,000 years. And yet, after 2,000 years, walking through a place about the size of Connecticut, <laughs> it did not convert. Only some souls converted, and the majority did not convert. They did not convert. And so, it's a mystery of grace, a mystery of the free will of man. There will always be souls that no matter what you tell them, no matter what miracle is performed, no matter how clear is the truth, they will turn in their hearts against God. They will spit against Him until the last moment, even if they are miraculously cured. How many times... Have, uh, did Pharaoh see the miracles of God? How many times did he see the power of God? And yet, he remained hardened in his heart. In fact, the scripture tells us that his heart became more hardened after every miracle. We learn also from the souls of the damned that God is, does not give every grace to every damned over and over again because they will reject it. They will reject it. They will reject it. Remember when our Lord was in Nazareth. He did not perform many miracles there. That's what the Gospel tells us. He went to Nazareth. He did not perform many miracles because of their lack of faith. Because if He performed the miracle, they would not believe. Now we find our serial cells in the year 2015. And in general, in the last hundred years, there have been miracles. There are miracles in our own times. There have been miracles. But they are not many like they were 800 years ago. There are not many as when Christ walked the earth. And why is this? God has the power to perform miracles, and He will show His miraculous power again. And He shows His miraculous power many times. But He will not perform many miracles in our times. Why? Because most souls are like Timotheus. Most are like Him. You can show them the truth of faith. You can show them the gospel. You can show them which way is up. You can show them all manner of truth. You can show all the miracles. You can show the maladies of the airplane. You can fly around. You can visit Rome and see all the bodies of the apostles. You can visit Nevers and see the miraculous body of St. Bernadette. You can inspect the tilma of Juan Diego yourself. You can fly to Turin and check out the shroud. And you can go to each place and see how the Catholic faith is planted in India. The Catholic faith is planted in Africa. The Catholic faith is planted in Asia. All throughout. The Catholic faith is planted in Europe. It is the only faith that has had a solid foundation throughout the world for 2,000 years. And you can see that it's the same faith. But the majority of souls have all the information. But they will not convert. What is the only answer? We know that by the prophecies of the seven ages of the church that there must come a chastisement. A chastisement, a purification of the world. And there will be a purification. You know what God told, what God told uh, the, the, the Joshua to do? When you go into the city of Jericho, you will kill every man, every woman, every child, and every beast. And so he did. He killed every man, every woman, every child, and every beast. 
except for one place. One place along the city wall, which is a bad, of all the unsafe places to live in Jericho, the city wall was the most unsafe place. We knew it was the most unsafe place because the walls of Jericho collapsed when there was a great shout that came from those Jews who in silence walked around seven times a city. And right now, in a certain way, there's silence. The voice, is, the voice of God is not being heard, not because He's not speaking through His prophets. He is speaking. He is speaking. And those who wish to hear, that I will give them the grace that they be able to hear. But the majority of souls will not hear. They have stopped up their ears. Like they did in the case of, of, of St. Stephen. When Stephen said, I saw, I see the gates of heaven opened. I see the angels standing on the right side of God. I see the glory of heaven. And what did they do? They stopped up their ears. And they began to scream with a loud voice lest they hear the words of Stephen. And with great haste they picked up St. Stephen, and they carried him out, and they stoned him to death, and he became the first martyr to die after Christ's death, crucifixion. Now we're at the time of the last martyrs. Our Lord himself said, The first shall be last, and the last first. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And what shall be the case of the last martyrs is similar to those of the first martyrs. St. Stephen speaking the beauty of the truth of the gospel. It cannot be tolerated. St. Stephen speaking the truth of Christ. It cannot be tolerated. And therefore, screaming with a loud voice. That's why, for instance, what's the real reason why Satan handed out earphones to everyone? What's the real reason why everybody's got noise on their cell phones? And you, now, you see people always in the airports. You can see 6,000 people together, all in the same place. Each of them looking at their cell phone. Each of them taking care of themselves. Each of them having earbuds. And if you don't see the earbuds, it's because they got Bluetooth and a small one. <laughs> it's not because they don't have one. And everyone is listening to noise. Why? To drown out the truth. And there are souls that if their blindness is taken away, and they see the truth, they will reject it. They exist in the Society of St. Pius X. They exist in the mainstream church. They exist all over Catholic tradition. They exist in the streets. They exist everywhere. So much so that we, we, we repeat the words of the Psalms of David. Where he said, Lord, there is not one that loves thee. There is not one that praises thee. No, not even one. And it's Isaiah, who spoke the most beautiful truths of all the four great uh, uh, prophets of the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And Isaiah says, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I have reported the truth of the gospel 800 years before the birth of Christ. I have reported the truth of the sacred scripture, the truth of Moses, the truth of God. I have reported all the truths of faith, but who has believed our report? No one. No one has believed it. And now open your eyes and see. Our Lord himself said, Shall there be any faith left when I return? What are some of the signs of the returning of Christ? A lack of faith. Is it because of the lack of information? Is it because of the lack of evidence? No, there is never a lack. Our Lord gives grace to every soul. He gives grace to everyone to see the truth. And if they reject it, it's because they have chosen to reject it. He gives grace all throughout the world. But souls reject. And if we want the truth, and we love the truth, God will find a way to somehow get it to us. He knows how to make the truth enter into the most remote places. He knows how to get inside of souls. In Januarius, there he was. And consider those 5,000 men that converted that day. They're going to be like the men of the end times. Were they holy? These 5,000 men decided to go to the amphitheater to watch the followers of Christ die. This is not one of the prerequisites of holiness. <laughs> They went there in order to see blood. They went there to see blood and go out that night and have a party, get drunk, and commit all the sins of the flesh. But before they would do that, they wanted to see blood. And they went into the amphitheater to see the blood of Christians. And they were really happy when Timotheus said, Put them to death. 
Last thing he wanted to hear was, let him live. <laughs> How boring is that? <laughs> the greatest tragedy that could happen to these 5,000 men was boredom. They wanted to have their violent video games. <laughs> they wanted to see real blood. They wanted, to, they wanted to be entertained. And they were really interested in sin. And so with a sinful heart, with a despising of God, they entered the amphitheater. And they, many thousands that were there, maybe 20,000 were inside that amphitheater. And 5,000 of them were wicked, and the other 15,000 were also wicked. And then they saw the wicked man say, put Januarius to death. They were also disappointed. How come these lions are licking the feet of Januarius? I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I want to see them eat them. I want to see them bleed. Go put him to death. And God strikes Timotheus blind. And 5,000 men say, wow. This is, this is another power. There's something high above us. There is a God. The God spoken of by Jonas, the prophet. The God that Jonas said to the other sailors, he says, you know there was a storm. There was a great storm. And you're all scared because of the storm, because you've never seen a storm like this before. And I will tell you why there is a great storm. Because I tried to flee from my God. And my God is not my God. He's the God of all gods. He's the only true God. He's the God that made the sea and dry land. He's the God that made the stars. And He is angry with me. And because He's angry with me, the storm has arisen. And the sailors were afraid. And they said, what are we to do? Because we have never seen a storm like under this. And this is the case in the world today. As we mentioned many times, about a year and a half ago, now I guess it's almost two years, more than two years ago. More than two years ago now, one, on one of the airplanes that I was flying on, talking to some guy next to me, and the man said, you know, Father, I'm an atheist, and I don't even believe in God, but I know he's mad. <laughs> and you know that many souls, talking to another taxi driver in London, says, you know, I'm not a man of God. I was raised as some kind of Protestant guy. But I just know that what they're telling me on the TV is a lie. And you know what I did, Father? Because what? I throw it out. <laughs> because they told me there's only two choices. There's only two choices. You can choose the conservative party or the liberal party. And I just know they're lying. Because they're both the same. And I don't have those two choices. I've got another choice. And I refuse to accept the choices the TV gives to me. So I threw the TV out. <laughs> and he threw it out, too. The London taxi driver telling me that as we're driving across London in the ugly London taxis. <laughs> and so the fact is that there are many souls today who do not want God, who do not want the truth, who are interested in staying in their life in sin, who like going to bad movies, who like doing wicked things. And in the midst of one day, they will see someone made blind, and that blind man will be able to see and they will convert. But the man that was blinded, the man that the miracle was done to, he shall not convert. And our Lord will repeat the words that he said so many times in the gospel. I came first to the Jews. I came first to them and I invited them to the supper. But a men and men I say to you that those who were invited to the supper, not one of them shall taste of my meats. Not one. And right now, our Lord Jesus Christ is saying to the traditional Catholics, you get first dibs. <laughs> you get the first choice. Do you want to follow Christ? Do you want to join His army? You're the son of Archbishop Lefebvre. You know about the errors of Vatican too. Do you want to join the army of Christ? Do you want to stand up for the truth? Are you willing to suffer a little bit for Christ? Are you willing to have the spirit of charity? I give you the first chance. And they say no. And they say no. And they say no. And they say no. Mm. And one day, it'll be just like Samson. We mentioned many times about Samson. <coughs> Samson sinned with Delilah. <coughs> and he was forgiven. And he sinned and he was forgiven. And he sinned and he was forgiven. And he sinned and he was forgiven. And he sinned. And he said, I will go out and shake myself as I did before. But he knew not that the Lord had left him. He was forgiven all the other times. But this time, he got a haircut. Mm -hmm. Anyone supposed to get a haircut? Mm -hmm. 
And this time he got a haircut. I mean, come on. The last times he was sinning and lying. This time he sinned and told the truth. Surely you should be forgiven. He got a haircut. And the Lord had left him. And this is happening to the Catholic tradition right now. There are souls throughout the entire world who God is calling to be priests. God is calling to be brothers. God is calling to be nuns. God is calling to be Catholic faithful, to stand up for the truth, to be willing to suffer a little bit for the truth. If we can't take a little suffering now, the fear of what? The fear of not being able to go to Mass in the ugly little building that we turned into a church? <laughs> The fear of being attacked by Menzingen, which is an ugly house in the middle of, the, of, of Switzerland with a bunch of stupid cows outside with bells. Are we afraid of these foolish things? What are we afraid of? If we're afraid of such simple things, and for the sake of this fear, we go away from God. For the sake of this fear, we do not stand for the truth. One day God will say, all right, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And we hear nothing. We feel the same. And next thing you know, the house is filled from the highways and the hedges. And then we go and buy some oil. And we come to the house and say, Lord, open the house for us. Let us in. And he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, I know you're not. Stay outside where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel is still true in 2015, just like it was 2,000 years ago. And our Lord's warnings of that time apply to this day. What He said concerning the Jews. Did all Jews abandon Him? No, only 99%. <laughs> there were some Jews that were faithful. Twelve of them were apostles. And they failed. One of them never rose again. The other eleven became saints. They were the 72 disciples. And they became saints. They were the holy women. But look at all the people He wanted to follow Him. There were several million Jews, and he wanted them to follow him. And they said, no, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Do you not hear it now? Right now, listen to the mystical body of Christ. And in the mystical body of Christ, right now, there are traditional Catholics saying, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. There are traditional Catholics who are not following the gospel. Who are seeing right before them, how what happened to our Trusible Lefebvre is now happening to us. What happened in the 1970s is now happening today. And God is giving the grace. He is not one to not give grace. He's giving the grace. But I don't want to see it because I've got my comfortable chapel. I don't want to see it because I've got my comfortable needs taken care of. I don't need to see the truth. Besides, when we got the Latin Mass, that's all we need. It's about the Mass anyway, isn't it? No. It's about our Holy Roman Catholic faith. That's what it's about. And we've lost it. Januarius, great miracles. And yet Timotheus now burns in hell. The recipient of the miracles of Christ through Januarius. Ten lepers, all cured. Nine of them wandered away from God, never to return. Only one came back to give thanks. And he was a stranger. He was a foreigner. He was a Samaritan. These are warnings for us. We have been given the truth. We belong to the true Israel, which is the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Are we going to respond to grace? We must respond. One day is going to be the last, and we won't know that day like Samson didn't know that day. He felt just as strong as he was before, only this time when he swung his arm, all that happened was he got beat up. <laughs> But he felt the same. And so it will be with us. The day that the devil comes, we will think that God is going to protect us. Just like those Jews we read about in the book of Kings. They said, Behold, the ark of the covenant is in our camp. Behold, the ark is with us. Let us go now and fight valiantly against the Philistines. And so they fought. And 20,000 or 30,000 were killed. And there was a great slaughter. And they were massacred. And the ark was captured. Because it is not enough to have the ark. It is not enough to have the mass. It is not enough to say, well, I've got my mass. If we don't have our faith, if we don't have charity, 
if we don't have the gospel in our hearts, and we don't live by the faith that like it says in the gospel today, then plan on great troubles. Plan on great troubles. And so, let us respond to the grace of God while it is being given. He's going to convert souls. Let these souls convert. How many chances will they be given? Let us return to God now. And let us stay faithful to Him. And God's grace reaches to the very ends of the earth. He can convert the pagans. He can convert the Jews. He can convert the atheists. And He also must convert the Catholics. Everyone needs to be converted. And are we going to respond to that grace or not? Let's beg the grace to respond from grace to grace. And this cannot be done without that beloved mediatrix of all grace. Only she, the mother of God, can help us to respond to the mediate to the grace of her son. And so let's beg Our Lady to help us to respond to His grace, and that she pour that grace of her Son inside of us, and that we remain faithful Catholics, faithful followers of Christ, and that we're sorry for our sins, sorry for our weakness, sorry for our idiosity, and we stand firm for our holy faith, and we want to follow Him. We want to go into battle. We want to run after Christ. We want to go wherever He leads. We want to be active members of His army. We want to help others come to Christ. We want to be able to stand for the truth and not just simply barely survive. It's a time of battle. In the time of battle, warriors are needed. And let's pray to the Lord of the harvest that He send these laborers, these warriors, into the harvest. Because the harvest indeed is great. The laborers, the warriors are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest and He will send us graces and vocations and conversions and souls who are going to be filled with Christ even in these times, God will never, ever, ever stop giving His grace. Let's respond to it. Blessed are God bless you all. In the, name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sunday after Pentecost, we'll be back here in New Jersey. And the epistle for the 17th Sunday is taken from St. Paul's under the Ephesians, chapter 4. Brethren, I, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling of the vocation calling with which you are called, with all humility and mildness, with patience, supporting one another in charity. Careful to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One body and one Spirit, as you are called, and one hope you are calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And in the Gospel, according to St. Matthew, chapter 22. At that time, the Pharisees came to Jesus and one of them, a doctor of the law, asked him, tempting him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like unto this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments dependeth the whole law and the prophets. And the Pharisees being gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of the Christ? Whose son is he? And they say to him, David's. He said to him, How then doth David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on thy right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forward Ask him any more questions. That's why the words of today's Holy Gospel. In the Father, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. We're now in the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and our Lord's Pharisees, the great doctor of the law, is tempting him. And it's getting towards the very end of the life of Christ. In the final battle, 
the final battle before he's crucified. The final battle now is happening in the church. The same final battle. It used to be the last time that the doctors will all try to trip up Christ. And they get to the essential point. What's the essential point? We are arriving at that time now in the church where what is the essential point? The doctor of the law. He knows the law very well, says St. Leo the Great in his sermon today. He knows the law so well. And he knows that there are two great commandments. And the first commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole soul, and thy whole mind. And the Jews got together and they said, We know that this man, Jesus Christ, he says that he's God. We know that he says if he be lifted up, he'll draw all things to himself. He has the audacity to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, and calls not upon the help of heaven. He has the audacity to command the winds and the sea without calling upon God. This man thinks that he is God. So therefore we will trap him, says St. Leo the Great. We're going to ask him this great question, which is the first commandment? And surely he is going to say, he's going to make an adjustment to the first commandment. He's going to say the first commandment is, you must serve me. He is going to trap himself. And they had it all figured out. These wise judges, these theologians, and these doctors of the law. They are very wise. But they couldn't outsmart Christ. And they outsmarted themselves. They are fools. And what did they do? They didn't make a calculation. St. Leo the Great says, what is the first commandment? Everyone knows it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This is the first commandment. With thy whole heart, thy whole soul, and thy whole mind. That's the first commandment. And they didn't make the calculation. If Jesus Christ is God, and he is, and the first commandment is to serve God, and the first commandment is to love God with the whole heart, the whole soul, and the whole mind, then the first commandment is to love Jesus Christ. With the whole heart, the whole soul, and the whole mind. And it is only one commandment because there is only one God. And these men have forgotten that. Modernists tell us that the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity was invented in the New Testament. But we know from sacred scripture, and we know from the teaching of our church, that the Jews knew about the Blessed Trinity in the Old Testament. That is why they said, the, Who is the which God are you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's the Blessed Trinity. The God of Abraham is the God of Isaac. The God of Isaac is the God of Jacob. They are not three gods. The God of Abraham, the Father. The God of Isaac, the Son. The God of Jacob, the Holy Ghost. And these theologians are supposed to know that. Great theologians gather together at the end of times. And their greatest minds come together. And what they come up with is foolishness. That a seven-year-old knows the answer to the question that the great theologian has forgotten. And this has happened in our church today. The great theologians don't know that there are three persons in one God. The great theologians think that the Jews worship the same God that we worship. Though they do not think Jesus is God. Therefore they are idolaters. And they do not worship the true God. They think the Muslims worship the same God we worship. Because they worship one God. One man may have another one God that he worships. I met in the Philippines. Many of the Chinese. They told me I know my God. The Catholic Chinese Filipinos. My God is money. <laughs> they were very honest with me. I worship money. That's my God. I have only one God. And he's infinite. <laughs> and I want all. <laughs> all of the money. <laughs> they told me that. Do they worship the same God we worship? Because he worships only one God. Money. He worships only one God. Allah. He worships only one God. Satan. 
How could the theologians not know the most simple question? There is only one God, and this God we must love with our whole mind, our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole being. That's the commandments. And the theologians don't know it. We find ourselves now in such a time. The theologians get together and they have deep theological discussions about the morality of homosexuality, about the morality of people getting uh, receiving Holy Communion after being divorced and remarried, about the morality of all these foolish things that the enemies of God who call themselves bishops of the church, the enemies of God who call themselves the cardinals and the Pope himself, what are they doing? They do not know the most simple teaching of the church. And the great theologians are gathering together. And for what purpose? To trap Christ. So it happened 2,000 years ago. So it happens today. Remember, these were real priests. These were not fake priests. These were true priests of the same religion to which we belong. Aaron was a priest of the, of the, of the same religion that I belong to. Caiaphas was the priest of the same religion that I belong to. And these were true doctors of the law in the final stage of the Old Testament. And they were supposed to know the simple truth that everyone knows the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And whoever worships the God of Isaac pleases Abraham. Whoever worships the God of Jacob pleases Abraham. Whoever worships the God of Abraham pleases Isaac and Jacob. For these three are one. In the New Testament, we call them the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And these fools, says St. Leo the Great, they are going to say, well, if Jesus is God, and God is God, then he wants himself to be God and not the other God. He's going to have to change the commandments. And he forgot that there are three persons in one God. And so this great sin has come upon the world. What is the great sin of our times? The greatest doctrine of our holy church. Of course, every sin exists today. There is no sin that does not exist. There is no heresy that is not believed. We are in the end of times in which every lie someone believes. Every wickedness someone follows. Every single evil exists simultaneously in our world today, and usually even in one man. But what is the greatest evil? To deny the blessed Trinity. And here we find these doctors of the law. Doctors of the law. Who do not know the God of Abraham is the same as the God of Isaac, and the same as the God of Jacob. They don't know. They don't know these simple truths. And they're going to trip up Christ. They're going to trip him up. And we have yesterday, as we mentioned in the earlier sermon, we finished reading the brief yesterday, the book of Job. 42 chapters, a long book. And the majority of this book is devoted to three wise men. Three wise men that are the advisors of Job. When you read the book of Job, the vast majority of the words of the book are filled by the quotations of these wise men. Each of them giving a false advice. Each of them telling Job, if you are suffering on your dunghill, if you have lost your wife and lost your health and lost all your possessions, it's because you have offended God. But he had not offended God and they were wrong. Well, if you have not offended God, then God has unjustly treated you, and therefore you should curse God. You should rise up and curse God because He has made you suffer. Do something. Don't just sit upon this dung hill, but curse Him. Or admit some fault that you do not have, but do something. And the advisors advised Him with most wicked advice. And they were good men. They were wise men. They were not the followers of Satan directly. They thought they were being wise. They thought they were being upright. They were trying to help Job. And they gave him wicked advice. And Job said, no. Naked was I born. Naked was I came into the earth. Naked return I to the earth. All else is a gift of God. The Lord giveth. 
The Lord taketh away. We are in the great final times of the world. Not the final times, but the penultimate times. The time just before the final time. And what is the battle? It is not the battle between a Catholic priest and a Satanist priest. It is not a battle between a Catholic faithful and a follower of Satan. It is not a battle of man against man, woman against woman. It is not even the battle of the angels against angels. It is a battle of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost against Satan. This is the great battle. And it is in its great fight right now. And who wants to be in this fight? They must choose. They must choose. Every soul must choose. Am I going to follow Lucifer? Am I going to see the light of Lucifer? Am I going to follow the light of his wisdom? Am I going to follow the light of the great doctors of the law who have abandoned the law? Or do I believe in one God in three divine persons? When Job finally spoke to God, he only asked one question. Lord, why? And God said, who are you to ask me a question? I've mentioned many times. Who are you to ask me a question? Let me ask you some questions. Did I ask you where to make the sea stop and the shore to begin? How high to make the mountains? How low the valleys? Where to put the stars and so on? Canst thou add one centimeter to thy height? Canst thou add one hair to thy head? What can you do? And Job could do nothing. And a very long, long tirade does God give against Job. And at the end, Job says, I'm sorry. And God said, I forgive you. And then he went to speak to the three advisors. And there's where we pick up yesterday in the Holy Bravery at the end of the book of Job. God went to speak to the three advisors. And he said to them, You three advisors, you read all your theology books. You know all the teachings of the prophets. You think you are wise men. You are just and upright. And you have spoken falsely. And you have advised wrongly. And therefore, you are worthy to be condemned. And you must beg forgiveness. And the three of the three advisors said, Lord, forgive us. Lord, we're sorry. And the gentleman cried, God said to the three advisors, You say you're sorry. I forgive you not. Do you want to be forgiven? Yes, we want to be forgiven. Don't ask me for forgiveness. Go to Job. For I will hear the words of Job. I will not hear your words. You beg forgiveness. You pray holy prayers. I will not hear them. Because you have spent this whole time recorded by the Holy Ghost speaking all these foolishnesses, giving all these profound reasons why we should find another way than the way of God. Why we should find another explanation than God to every trouble in the world. And while every trouble should be blamed upon God. This is what you have done. What has God done? God said, let there be light. And because he said this, there is light. God created a perfect world. Because he spoke, the world is perfect. All that is good comes from God. And what is not good is nothing. And nothing is the only thing that doesn't come from God. And what is evil? A participation in nothingness. The only thing that God is not the author of is evil. And yet we blame Him for the only thing He's not author of. And the goodness we pull to ourselves. And we think we're wise. And the three wise men begged forgiveness of God. And He did not forgive. Do you want to be forgiven? Go to Job. He prays, if He forgives you, I forgive you. In fact, it was a kind of a foretelling of the sacrament of penance. An Old Testament foretelling of the sacrament of penance when our Lord said, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. 
whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. This has not only happened in the New Testament, it also happened in the Old. Remember that Moses, God was angry and was going to destroy the Jewish people. And Moses said, Lord, do not do this thing. And because Moses prayed for the Jews, he forgave them. But if the Jews prayed, he would forgive them not. There is a divine economy. Why does God listen to one man's prayer and reject another? And they say the same holy words. Why is it that one man speaks and God hears? Another man speaks the same words and he rejects. What is it? What it is, how much of God is in my mind? How much of God is in my heart? How much of God is in my soul? Do I really adore God? Do I really love God? Is He really the center of everything? And the answer is no. For the vast majority of souls. And no to God is a participation in nothingness. Emptiness. You know why there are so many suicides today? Why there is so much deep depression today? Why there is so much medication being handed out? Why everyone must take pills? Because they have said no to God and they have nothing and emptiness inside of their minds and emptiness inside of their hearts and they have no answer. No answer to the troubles of the world. And no matter how many idiots how many morons, how many theologians, how many liars they heap up to them to tell them that their homosexuality is good, that their Protestantism is good, that their lies against God is good, that their new mass is good, that their wickedness is good. No matter how many times they hear the wickedness is good, it fills them not up. Like St. Ambrose says concerning the prodigal son, he ate the husks. He ate the husks. And what is a husk? The final food of the prodigal son as he's dying of starvation. It's a bean that has nothing on the inside. Only a husk. And when it is consumed, it loads rather than nourishes. And we become more hungry. What is this husk? It will be the final teaching of the world. Says so Venerable Bede. The final teaching. For the end of the world, man will have itching ears. He will not want to hear the truth that comes from the mouth of God. And what is the truth? His name is Jesus Christ. The truth is what comes forth from his mouth. And we are in the great war between the truth and the lie. Between Satan and God. And all we are is bystanders. Like St. John says... We saw His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the, of, the, of the Father, full of grace and truth. We're only seers of His glory. Or as St. Jerome says, we're like Tobias' dog that we mention so often. When Tobias comes home, the dog goes out and greets him and wags his tail. So we likewise greet God and wag our tails. That's all we can do. Do we belong to the kingdom of Christ or not? Do we believe in the power of God. He's testing us right now. Are we ready to stand for the faith? As Job did. Are we ready to stand for God as Tobias did? Are we ready to stand for him as Moses did in the desert. When all the Jews abandoned him and he prayed for them. Are we ready to stand for him as the apostles did? And as all the great saints of the last 2,000 years did. Are we ready to stand for God? Imitate the little Joan the maid in France when she was told by the priests, by the bishops, you're alone, you're all alone, and we are great theologians, and we know the faith and you can't even read. We have declared you a heretic, we have declared you a liar, we have declared you an enemy of God, and you are all alone. And she said, yes, alone with God. And that kind of alone is the most happy alone that can be. Now the devil is surrounding souls. He's surrounding many souls. He wants us to turn away from the faith. 
He wants us to turn away from His commands. He wants us to turn away from His law. He wants us to follow the modern world and His thinking and His teaching. Everyone's going along with sin. Everyone's going along with lies. Everyone's going along with all the evils that are in the world today. You can't fight it. So join it. Go along with it. Who is ready to stand alone? God will never leave us alone. But let us seem like we're alone for a little while, perhaps. But He'll never leave us alone. But are we ready to stand alone? It all depends on whether or not we believe in God. You know, in the final battle, when all the wounds of the enemy are upon us, when all the attacks of the enemy are around us, we cannot come up with great long theological discussions. We can't remember all of our prayers. We will not even be able to say in great pain or have to hold hell there. But what can we do? We can believe in God. We can have faith. We can know that that faith is real. And that faith conquers all. And that faith is passed on to us through the hand of Mary. Through her, her who is the mediatrix. She who protects us. She was the mother of that faith. Can we persevere in marriage? Can we persevere in the faith in the modern world? Can we make another step fulfilling our duties as we're wounded, struggling from day to day? Can we make one more step? By the grace of God, we can make a step and another step and another step and another step and another step until the time of the victory. And we know not the day or the hour why is that? Because God wants us to have faith. It may be sooner than we think. But we must have faith. Because we know not the day or the hour. And why was it the final time that they durst not ask him any more questions? Because the one thing they were afraid of was admitting that Jesus Christ is really God. And therefore, our Lord asked a question. Just like God asked Job a question, and he asked those men a question, the three wise advisors, so the Christ said, all right, I'm going to ask you a question. Whose son is the Messiah? He's David's son. All right. Then why does David call his son Lord? No father calls his son Lord. The father is Lord. Why does David call his son Lord? And they durst not answer him, because the only way in which David could call his son Lord is if his son is God. And David called his son Lord. He knew the Messiah would be Lord. He knew the Messiah would be God. He knew that God made man would be his descendant. And therefore he called him Lord. And if they admitted that, they would be admitting that he is God. And they cannot. <clears throat> What's the error of the new religion? The new conciliar church, the priest faces the people. Why? Because man is God, and he leaves out God, leaves out Christ. Who is God? God is God. And we have to decide, do I believe God is God, or do I believe man is God? Am I going to follow mammon, or am I going to follow God? And we must ask the grace of heaven to truly be able to follow God. And going back to those three men, the three advisors, in the conclusion of the book of Job, what did they do? They went to Job and said, Job, we are sorry. And as a symbol of our sorrow, we give you seven oxen, seven sheep, I believe is the other thing. And they gave it to him and said, Job, pray for us. For the Lord told us, if you do not pray for us, we will not be forgiven. And though we spent all that time giving you such false advice, will you pray for us? And Job prayed before God. And they were forgiven. Because God heard the prayer of Job. And not the prayer of those wise men. Wise men pray. Imagine the prayers. The day in which there was more prayer than any other time in the history of the world. Was the day in which there was a flood. And water was coming down from heaven. And all men were drowning except for the eight that were inside of the ark. And the others were praying. And they were praying so hard that they may not drown. 
praying so hard that they might live, praying so hard the water would not cover their mountain. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and their prayer was not heard. And every one of them drowned. Because there is a mystery of the economy of salvation. It is not enough that I pray. It is not enough that you pray. There must be some souls whom God loves. Some souls that suffer a little for Him. Some souls that only He knows. They pray and I am saved. And if they pray not, I am lost. St. Teresa of the child Jesus prayed. And a soldier, a man who was a guilty criminal and a wicked man who had committed murder and who would refuse to repent. He would not repent, but because she prayed, he's now in heaven. And so it is to this day. God has not changed his ways. There must be some souls that have God in their minds. And no room for anything else. And God in their hearts. And even in the midst of suffering, we refer all to God. What's the trouble with these three advisors? You see, they thought that Job was cursed because... Because he lost his money. And now they knew he was not cursed because he had a more beautiful wife than he had before. <laughs> he had more cattle than he had before. He had a bigger house than he had before. So he must be blessed. And they were wrong about his blessing as they were wrong about his curse. For the same reason that they said he was cursed. For the same reason they said he's blessed. And therefore they had not repented before God. And hence God would not hear their prayer. He would not hear it. Job knew what blessing was. He knew that blessing was to keep the purity of God's love in our hearts. Because the one great commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole mind, and thy whole soul. And then St. Leo says, But when God answers questions, He always answers more. Therefore our Lord said, And the second is like unto it, That thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For God did not only love God, His love was poured out into nothingness. And He created an infinite number of magnificent and beautiful things, which we call the creation of this world, which He created good and perfect over the course of six days. And there's an infinite magnificence and beauty and wonder in this creation of God. He poured Himself out, and He created our neighbors, and He created all things to show forth the wonders and magnificence of His goodness. And if we love God, if the love of God is in our hearts, then we're filled with a fire to pour it out. And if we don't pour it out, it's not God love. God love is always poured out. And if we say we love God, but we try to hold it in, it's not the love of God. It's the love of self. It's the love of security. It's the love of safety. But it's not the love of God. The love of God must always be poured out. We must pray to, that God sends more souls into the world who are ready to pour out the divine love. Pour it out. Pour it out. When we see that someone is in need, we should be on fire. As St. Paul says, which of you suffers and I'm not on fire? If someone is in need, we should be on fire, filled with a necessity. As our Lord, as St. Paul said, Caritas Christi urget nos. The charity of Christ urges us, moves us, forces us. We are driven by it. A mother was found pregnant with a child, but the child was the son of God. And she heard that Elizabeth was a child in her old age. And she was driven. Driven by an uncontrollable force called the divine love. And she went to take care of her cousin Elizabeth. And when she arrived there, through her presence, her son sanctified John the Baptist. And John the Baptist announced it to Elizabeth. And a great blessing came because she was driven by the love of God. And that love drives. And if the love does not drive, it's not the love of God. So we pray to the Blessed Virgin to pour that love, that first love inside of us. And the proof of that love is that it drives us. Drives us to pour good in the world around us, to build the kingdom of Christ. To find a way to bring others to Him. To help those in need, the poor and the sick. It must be in our blood, in our hearts, because that's what God love is. A love that pours itself forth. And therefore he says, 
The first commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with the whole heart, the whole soul, and the whole mind. But the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love of neighbor, necessity. And it must be a necessary love that enters our hearts. And when this love of neighbor is in our hearts, God will begin to hear our prayers. So many prayers are being said, but they are not being heard. Which prayers are going to be heard? The ones that come from a soul that has love of God in the mind, truly. In the heart, truly. In the passions, in the whole being. So in any case, let's pray for this love to enter our hearts. It must enter. It must enter. But it cannot be done without the grace of God. And remember, in this world, so many people, seven billion souls, all made by the love of God, all sustained by the love of God, all made to see Him face to face. And the devil is trying to drag every one of them down into his kingdom of hell. If we know the truth, if we love it, we know we're part of a kingdom. Remember that Gesmas prayed on the cross, If you be the Son of God, save yourself, save us. And Christ did not save himself, and he did not save Gesmas. He now burns in hell. But another thief prayed, and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What is the proof that we know that we love God? Well, the proof that our sign that we are in with God. When you look out of this world in Sparta, New Jersey, look in New York City, and all our gay pride parade, look at the evil going on in the world around us, and see this world as the kingdom that Christ is going to conquer. And see all souls as souls meant for the kingdom of God. And whoever is not into that kingdom shall find himself cast down into the exterior darkness. And there we whoever sees with the eyes of truth knows that every soul and every place was meant for the kingdom of God. And here he was hanging on the cross, bleeding and dying. And he thought of the kingdom of Christ. That this man is a king. That this man is in charge. That this man is God. That this bleeding one who hangs on the cross, he's king. That this woman who stands at the foot of the cross, she is queen. And she's ruling right now. While Caiaphas mocks. And he's ruling right now. Those nails are not holding to the cross. It is his will. Because that is his throne. And he could choose another throne if he wanted. But he chose that throne. And his throne is... Good enough for him, that's good enough for me. And therefore, happily, did St. Dismas hang upon that cross. And who will be your throne, Lord? Though I deserve to be crucified, and thou dost not deserve to be crucified. Remember that I hang upon a cross, as you hang upon a cross. Through the cross you rule. Take me with the cross to your kingdom. And with his eyes... In the midst of the great battle, when John did not see, who was not yet a saint. When Peter did not see, who had wandered away from God. When the other apostles did not see, the thief saw God. And we are in a great fight. Who sees God? Whoever is of the truth sees God. In Sparta, New Jersey. Whoever is of the truth sees God in our country of America, sees God in the ocean, sees God in all the world, and His kingdom shall not be stopped. We learn these things in catechism class, and we close the book, and then we try to get on with our real lives. The real life of making money, trying to avoid paying taxes. The real life of just getting by. The real life of finding an apartment to live in, which is going to be destroyed with fire at the end of the world, and probably won't last that long, because the construction wasn't so good. That is not real life. That is a fake life. Too many people today live a fake life. They know not what reality is, and of course they're in despair, because they're living in their own reality. That's why they are so fond of computers, 
and so fond of video games because the fakeness that they live in their house, the fakeness they live at their workplace, the fakeness that they live every morning when they take a shower and think they're clean, when they're filthy from the top of their minds to the bottom of their toes, and there's a filth and sin and stench inside of them, and they have every kind of shampoo and every kind of... When I go to people's houses sometimes, one of my great fears is which one is the shampoo? <laughs> Remember one house I go to, it says horse this and horse that. Says, is this stuff safe? <laughs> Which one's the shampoo? All I want to do is get a soap, a bar of soap. I, can know, I know what that is. <laughs> every kind of cleaning agent, every kind of toothpaste, to do what? To live in virtual false reality. To think that you're clean because you got healthy toothpaste. Because you got 5,000 cans of different kinds of shampoo and a full stack of TP. That is not cleanliness. Soul is a, it is a fake reality, a non-reality. Because the only reality is the soul is clean when the soul is with God. And the soul is dirty when the soul is without God. And we are in a world that's filled with so much filth. And they know it. And they know it, and that's why they always want to take showers. That's why they always want to fa fake cleanliness. That's why they say they remove all the trash from the streets. And they make a false, fake uh, sterility in our world. Because they're not with God. God is the reason for all things. And not God is the cause of all sorrow, all in wickedness all sin. And in our final times, let us simply love God. Love this holy mass in which God is. Love the holy faith, which is the expression of God. Love the holy church, which is his mystical body. Love his holy mother. She was the mother of God. And all things are surrounded about God. And whoever does not think in this way does not know how to think. And hence, we are the most stupid people that have ever been born in the history of humanity. Because they know not God. And so, let's bring back the knowledge of God. And how is this done? One movement of one little finger of the divine power. In one second, in one instant, at any moment that he wills. How hard is it him for him to bring back this kingdom? It's not hard at all. It is only going to be done at the moment of his own choosing. And he told us it will come, his victory. It will be by the hand of his mother. And we have to simply wait for that holy victory. And stay faithful. And make sure God is in our minds when we sit on dunghills like Holy Job. That God is in our hearts when we suffer. That we speak to God in our struggles. And he will hear our prayers. And the angels will star them up. And one day shall come the most wonderful blessings because we have thought of God, because we have turned to God when we did not understand and did not know what to do. And so, let us be with Christ in this final battle, love Him with all our hearts, and ask the Blessed Virgin Mary to pour this love of God into our hearts, and if it's there, it will be poured out and poured out and poured out. And then there will be more blessings brought to the world. Those that God bless you all, with the Father, and the Son, and the Ghost. Amen. Well, then today is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, and uh, we're going to be back here in, in Hartford. And the epistle for this uh, 17th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the... St. Paul said to the Ephesians chapter 4, Brethren, I, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all humility and mildness, and with patience, supporting one another in charity, careful to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you are called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And the Gospel.
Taking that according to St. Matthew chapter 22. At that time, the Pharisees came to Jesus, and one of them, a doctor of the law, asked him, tempting him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like unto this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments dependeth the whole law and the prophets. And the Pharisees being gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think thou of the Christ? Whose son is he? And they say to him, David's. He saith to them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. So in the Father, and Son, and the Ghost, Amen. In this 17th day of Pentecost, the, our Lord has a battle with the Pharisees. And a little consideration of that in part. And also, yesterday, we finished in the Holy Breviary, the book of Job. The final considerations of Job, and the great man that suffered. And then this week, God had his conversation with Job and told him, you know, our, our Job simply said, Why? Why, Lord, did you make me suffer when I have followed thy law? And the Lord had a long response to Job. He said, Job, where were you when I placed the mountains? Where were you when I put the valleys? Did you decide the, where the sea should begin and where it should stop and where the shore should begin and where it should stop? And after the, the, our Lord got a very long correction of Job, Job wept and he, made, he asked to be forgiven. And then at the very end of the book of Job, God turned then to the three advisors. The three advisors. Remember that Job... Job was, uh, the, had three advisors during the 40 chapters. Most of those chapters, three advisors said to him, God should not have done. He shouldn't have allowed you to suffer. He shouldn't have, he should not, he, he who is the true God would not allow you to suffer. And God's allowing you to suffer. He allowed your wife to die. He allowed you to have boils. He allowed you to sit upon this hill. Therefore, you should curse God. Therefore, you should blame God. And the three advisors gave all kinds of reasons why Job should blame God, why Job should curse God. And our Job kept giving all the right answers. Job said, No, naked was I born, naked return unto the earth. All else is a gift from God. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But the three advisors spoke to him. And at the very end of the book of Job, God goes and speaks to the three advisors. And he says, You have not spoken rightly. Therefore, you must beg forgiveness and you must, and you cannot be forgiven. God said to the to the to the three advisors, "You cannot be forgiven unless Job pray for thee. For I will hear the words of Job, but I will not hear thy words. And therefore, you must do penance. You must go and get oxen. And they went and got oxen. Each of them got seven oxen. And you must take them and give them to Job in reparation for the false advice." And they, they, all of the, the, the advisors, they went and they bought seven oxen. They came back to Job and they gave them to Job, saying, I am sorry for our bad advice. And each of them bought an earring. And they, each of them had a golden earring and they gave the golden earring to Job. And then they sat around the table with Job and they bemoaned their bad advice. And they sat around with Job and they talked to him at the table and they, they spoke of the true advice of Job and the evil advice of themselves, and they made reparation for their evil advice. They gave seven oxen and think seven sheep, and they gave a golden earring. And then they had to sit around and bemoan with Job. And then Job lived 140 years after all these things happened, and he saw his children's children to the third and fourth generation. And when we have a marriage, 
one of the part of the marriage blessing, we say, may you see your children's children to the third and fourth generation, as holy Job did. Job had his wife die, he had all his children die, but then God gave him a new wife and gave him more children than he had, and, and, and he said it is, it also makes a note in the book of Job that his daughters were the most beautiful of all the women upon the earth. And his, he, had the, he had the greatest of children, he had the greatest of lives, and he was more wealthy than he was before, and God showed great glory in Job. And the important point here, which applies to our times, we consider today a little bit the wicked advisors. The wicked advisors who gave many good reasons why God made a mistake. Many good reasons why things shouldn't happen the way they are. And there are many such men in the world today. And these wicked advisors give all kinds of vice against, advice against God. And one of the, way, one of the th principles, remember that sacred scripture tells us, money is the root of all evil. Money is the root of all evil. It is not only the root of greed, it is not only a means of impurity, it is not only a, a means of lies and murder, not only a means of fighting between husband and wife, but money changes our thoughts, and money changes our words, changes our thinking. Why is it that Job, for instance, must turn against God because he has lost all of his money. He has lost all his wealth. He's lost his home. He's lost his wife. He's lost his kids. And because he's lost these material things, therefore, one advisor tells him, you must have sinned. But Job was not aware of sin. You must go against God because if God, God, God because they believe, like the Protestants, these three advisors, that God... God, if he blesses us, we're going to have, whenever we get saved and we find the Lord, we also find an increase in pay. We also find a nicer house. The Lord bless me, like all the Protestant ministers say. I received the Lord. I was a great sinner, and I went and I received the Lord, and the Lord blessed me, and now I got four cars. I got six Lamborghinis. And so they all was blessed by the Lord. Now I don't care about these things. <laughs> And all we believe, like Protestants, the blessings of the Lord equals the reception of money. The curse of the Lord equals the loss of money. The blessing of the Lord equals the receiving of health. The curse of the Lord equals the loss of health. And therefore we look at these things, and therefore our advices come in this manner. And these three advisors advised, and their advice was wicked. And what's interesting to note in the book, at the end of the book of Job, is that God not only, because they had spoken evil words... And because he had given evil advice, what did it do to their prayer? God came to, the, to, the, to these three advisors and he said to them, You can beg forgiveness of me. You can speak to me as you spoke to Job. I will not hear what you say. I will not hear it. Remember it says in the book of wisdom concerning the damned, They cried unto the Lord, but he heard them not. One man cries to the Lord and he is not heard. Another man cries to the Lord and he is heard. And why is it this way? Because holy Job, when he was suffering, when he experienced the cross, he stayed faithful to God. When he was suffering, when he experienced the cross, he returned all glory to God. But the three, the three advisors who were not even suffering... The three advisors, seeing the suffering of Job, encouraged him to turn against God and encouraged him to turn against God in various ways. There's all kinds of subtle advices against Job's, against, uh, to get Job to, in one way or another, turn against God. And they gave many, many advices and many, many words in the long book of Job. And all these wicked advices, some of them are obviously wicked, some of them did not seem wicked. But what did it do? It tainted the mouth. When a man comes to you as a liar, we have a man that comes and says, you know that, he's an alcoholic, he's a drunk, he is a, he is a druggie. And he, he says, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. I'm not going to be a drunk anymore. You can trust me, I'm clean. You know they're lying. And one day they might tell the truth. And you will not believe them. So likewise, when these three advisors said, we're really sorry, why were they sorry? They were sorry because they saw that Job got his wife back and she was more pretty than the first one. <laughs> and they were sorry because Job got really rich and he was more rich than he was the last time. And they were sorry because Job was in a better spot than he was before. And he said, oh darn, we were wrong. And why were they wrong? 
because they thought he wouldn't get money back, but he did. They thought he wouldn't get a more beautiful wife, but he did. They thought he wouldn't get his health back, but he did. And therefore, they were wrong in the first 40 chapters, and they were wrong when they repented. And this is the repentance of many souls that's going to come to many souls. It's happening right now to many souls. Lord, I'm so sorry because I lost my job. I'm so sorry because I'm thrown into the streets. I'm so sorry because now I'm in the streets. Now I lost my job. Now I lost my house. Now I lost my pension. Now I don't have anything. Lord, I'm sorry. But why are they sorry? Because they lost their job. Why are they sorry? Because they lost their pension. If the pension comes back and the job comes back, the sorrow disappears as quickly as the pension comes back. Their sorrow is likened to a mitigated sorrow of the bad thief. The bad thief was very sorry. He was sorry that he was being crucified. He was sorry that he was being nailed to the cross. He was sorry that he was being mocked. He was sorry that he was dying ahead of schedule. He was sorry because of his pain. He was not sorry for sin. And he turned to God and he prayed. He prayed. And he said, Lord, if thou be the Son of God, save yourself and save us. And if you can't save yourself, at least save us. And so he prayed. Now this was the wicked prayer, but the three advisors are not as wicked as Dismas, as Gesmas. They're not as wicked as Gesmas. But yet, it is the same problem. They don't seem as Gesmas is clearly a thief. He's clearly a murderer. He's clearly wicked. He clearly shows no sorrow for his sin. But he prays, save yourself and save us. And Christ does not save him. And Christ does not save himself. And Christ does not hear the prayer of Gesmas. He rejects the prayer of Gesmas. He turns to the thief Dismas on the other side, and he says, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. And Dismas did not even ask to be saved. Dismas only asked to be remembered when Christ came into his kingdom. And what is this? Why is Dismas's prayer heard? Gesmas's prayer rejected? Why is it that when God comes down to the three, the three, the three uh, advisors of Job, He says, you can pray, you can beg forgiveness, you can weep. I will not care about your weeping. I will not hear your prayer. Therefore, you won't pray to me, you pray to Job. Because if Job forgives thee, I will forgive thee. If Job prays, then I will hear Job's prayer. And if you don't get Job to pray for you, you will be damned. And he told them, you get Job. And here we see the, the, the divine economy. The divine economy. What is most necessary in our world today? It is most necessary that there be souls like unto Job who pray for the other souls. Not just the wicked ones like Dismas who turned away from God and was a thief. But the ones who do not think that they are so wicked. The ones that... They, are not, they pay their taxes, they do their job, they obey the law of God, they fulfill all the rules. And then when they see a man of God suffer, they say, oh, you must have sinned. You're only receiving the loss of money because you must have sinned. People are turning against you because you sinned. You have boils because you sinned. You have wickedness because you sinned. And if you didn't sin, then curse God. And so they give wicked advice. St. Francis Xavier tells, St. Francis de Sales tells us, why the earring? What is the symbol of the golden earring? And God, God said to, the, to these three advisors, you must go back to Job and beg forgiveness. And they brought seven oxen. And they brought a golden earring. And why a golden earring? And St. Francis de Sales says, he says that when, when, God, when, when Isaac saw Rebecca, and he fell in love with her, he immediately gave her a golden earring. And when he gave her the golden earring, what did it do? It made it, it the, what is the purpose, or what is the symbol of the earring that the woman wears, according to St. Francis de Sales, also quoting some of the fathers of the church before him. The purpose of the earring is it shows that when a woman wears a golden earring, as Rebecca did, she will hear only good words. She will hear only truth. She will not hear cursing. She will not hear wickedness. She will not turn her ear to murmuring. She will not turn her ear to gossip. And hence, only charity, which is the symbol of gold, goes into her ears, and only truth goes into her ears, and only goodness goes into her ears, and then she learns wisdom. Why must they give a golden earring? Because they have spoken evil 
though it wasn't as obvious as the cursing of the wicked man. But they were given wicked advice. And what is the wicked advice? It is advice related to money. As one parishioner mentioned to me recently in a kind of discussion, he says the trouble of the modern family is that the nucleus of the family is supposed to be Holy Mother the Church. But the nucleus of the family today is money. Hmm. That's what the family centers around. What are you trying to do as you raise your children? You're trying to make sure that they live in a comfortable house. You're trying to make sure that they get a proper education. What's a proper education? An education that gets them a good job. You're trying to make sure that they make their way in society, that they're able to support their children, that they're able to live in a, in a good middle class, since we're all mediocre. We're going to live in a middle class society. And they want to receive a sufficient money. And you're a good parent if your child is able to be responsible with money. And you're a bad parent if he's not. And if you're not, you tell your son, don't steal because then you might go to jail. Don't do wicked things because it will be bad for you. If you're dishonest in business, people will stop trusting you. But honesty pays. Honesty works. And so we, we preach honesty. And we preach virtue. For what purpose? In order to get through life. In order to get sufficient blessings from God so He doesn't get mad at us so we don't lose our job. In order to be able to have a sufficient funds and sufficient care. And we give advice based on material prosperity. And that's the reality of our materialistic society. Catholic or not Catholic. Holy or not holy. And all this advice which says to be responsible with money. To be responsible in your job. To be honest. For what purpose? To get by. To sustain this family. You don't make decisions as to where to live. You don't make decisions as to what to do. You don't make the decisions as to how you're going to live about wife or husband based on Christ. You make the decision based on money. You make the decision based on security. You make the decision based on stability in this life. That's what you make the decision based on. What is the difference for St. Dismas? Dismas, while he was hanging upon the cross, what did he say to Christ? He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. His thought was of the kingdom of heaven. Father Urban Snyder used to mention many times to us, when I was a child, there is a special place in purgatory, for a special suffering for souls that do not desire heaven. There's a special suffering for just not desiring heaven. There isn't a suffering just for the sins we commit. There's a suffering for not desiring heaven. And it's amazing how many of us Catholics, how many of those that follow Christ, do not desire heaven. We desire heaven on earth. We desire a very peaceful and happy life. We desire the 140 years of good times that God gave to Job. We desire the happy life on earth. We do not desire heaven. And as a result, our thinking, our judgments, our advices, that which comes out of our mouth is not of God. And even when we say holy things, they are not holy. And when we beg forgiveness, we shall not be forgiven. Therefore, God spoke to the three, three advisors, and He says, go ahead and pray to me if you want. I'm not hearing your prayer. Not interested in what you have to say. Because you're saying... Even you say, Lord, forgive us. We're sorry for having me a bad advice, but you're sorry for the wrong reasons. You're sorry for the same reasons why you asked Job to curse. Now you're sorry for the same reasons. I will not hear such a prayer. And so many souls pray this way. What is going to happen when the commies come and they try to shoot everyone in the hotel? <laughs> There's going to be lots of spiritual people in the hotel. <laughs> And when they went, how many people prayed? There was more prayer on the face of the earth during the 40 days of the flood than at any other time in history. There was prayer, and it was most fervent, and it was most sincere. And those that prayed it are dead. Because it is not enough to say the right words to God. Our Lord himself said, He who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father. And what is it? St. Saint Leo the Great, the Pope, tells us in, this, in his sermon today, he says, when the Pharisees and the doctors came to Christ to trap him, they knew that Jesus Christ claimed to be God. And they knew that he thought he was the number one. Jesus Christ was number one. 
And so they asked him, Master, which is the great commandment? Thinking that he would change the commandment from thou shalt serve the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve to thou shalt serve me. And they said, oh, he's going to change the commandment and therefore a master of the law. And it's interesting about this master of the law. He is a fool. Like the modern masters of the law. He thinks he's so intelligent. But he didn't do the math. He didn't do the calculations. If the first commandment is to adore God, and Jesus Christ is God, then the first commandment to adore God means to adore Christ. He doesn't need to change the commandment. But these idiots, who had all kinds of degrees in theology, said we can trap him. We will trap him because he says he's God and we know the first commandment is to adore God. He's going to change the first commandment to adore himself. And so they tried to trap him, says St. Leo. And they said, Master, what is the first and the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and thy whole mind. And then St. Leo says, And Christ, when he answers, he never just answers. He gives more. He gives more. Out of the abundance of his heart. Out of the abundance of his mind. Out of the abundance of his truth. He doesn't just answer. He always gives more. And therefore he says, And the second commandment is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And why is it like unto it? Modern fools try to trap the follower of Christ. And they try to find a way to say that, well, you're against the Pope, and you're against God, and you're against this, and you're against that. The commandments never change. And here they try to use the commandments, the most simple commandments, in order to trap Christ. And of course they fail. They fail. But what is it that makes God hear the prayer of Job, and God not hear the prayer of Gesmos, and God not hear the prayer of the three wise men that advised Job? It is really quite simple. In Job, God is first. In the others, self is first. It's that simple. That's why it says in the book of wisdom, as we quote so many times, chapter 8, the tree leaneth to the north or to the south. Where it leaneth, there it falls. Where it falls, there it shall lie. No mention of mortal sin. Where does the tree of our heart lean? What is the priority in my heart? Is it myself or is it my God? And one of the reasons why God allows us to experience sufferings, why He allows us to be tempted, is to see and to test. He knows the answer, but we don't know the answer. Because we all check in the mirror every morning. And we come out holy. We pass a test every time. And so therefore God allows that there be sufferings. God allows that there be trials. So that we might open our eyes and see, I think God is first, but not when Starbucks is out of coffee. I think God is first, but not when I'm in a traffic jam. I think God is first, but not when the smallest discomfort comes my way. And I find myself willing to do things that I never thought I would ever do. And so it will be at the end of times. So many souls who want to serve God. So many souls that are very good. When the Antichrist comes, when the, the, the test comes, they will fail so quickly, with, so, with not even the slightest effort against the enemies of God. They will be the first ones to turn in the priests. The first ones to turn in their neighbors. The first ones to lead others to, to the death and to the camps. They will very happily do it. Good souls. Why? Because their goodness is like the goodness of the three wise advisors of Job. It is a self-conceited goodness. They speak of God many times in those 42 chapters. They speak spiritual words many times in those 42 chapters. They give good theological reasons why Job should curse God. Or Job should be sorry for his hidden sins. But Job stands straight. And they, three advisors, try to get him to turn off the path. And so likewise, there are many advisors today. We're going to find a new way to serve Christ. We're going to find a new way to survive in the great troubles to come. 
We're not going to follow the example of the saints. We're not going to follow the example of the gospel. We're not going to follow the simple answers given to us by Christ and the gospel. We're going to find another way. And what is the priority? Though we cannot admit it, it is our own comfort and money. That's the reality of life. That's just the way it is. Who is ready to give up their house, to give up their possessions for the sake of adoring God, for the sake of standing for the truth? We all think we are ready to do it, but only God knows who is. And He knows quite well that there are few. And what's one of the signs? It's in the book of, we mentioned the other day, it's like in the city of Nazareth. Christ was in the city of Nazareth, and right now Christ is in Hartford, Connecticut. Christ is all over the United States. Christ is all over the world. But he did not perform many miracles because of their lack of faith. Why are there not many miracles in America? Why are there not many miracles in Europe and in Asia and all over the world? Because of our lack of faith. And because of their lack of faith, he performed not many miracles. And why was this? Because each miracle brings about a curse rather than a blessing. Because his souls won't convert. And if we see so few miracles around us, and we see so few, so few souls turning to the true faith, even though there are so many good people, this means that our hearts, the hearts of the mass of humanity, is, are against God. And are not thinking in the way of God. And all those that pray, like the three men, the three, the, the three, the three advisors who said, Lord, forgive us. Lord, we're sorry for having given Joe bad advice. We don't really mean, we are really sorry because now we see how rich he is. Now we see how his wife is better than it was before. If only we had known. If only we had known. How many souls will say at the judgment, if only we had known what eye hath not seen. If only we had heard, known what ear hath not heard. If only we had known what, is, what has not entered in the heart of man, what God has prepared for those that love him. We wouldn't have done all these wicked things. If only we had known how bad hell was and how hot was the fire and how horrible was the place. We wouldn't have done all these things. So they say. And they remain damned for eternity. And they lie. Our Lord wants to know who loves him. And therefore St. Leo the Great tells us, note what Christ says about the second commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, thy whole soul, thy whole mind, and thy whole self. And the second commandment is like unto it. It's just like the first commandment. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What did God do? God loved nothingness as himself. And since he loved nothingness as himself, he poured his infinite perfections, his infinite goodness, his infinite beauty, his infinite magnificence of every sort. All the magnificent wonderfulness of God is poured into all the billions and billions and billions of elements of the universe. And everywhere we look and see, we see the goodness of God. We see the beauty of God. We see the power of God. We see the gentleness of God. We see all the virtues of God in all the animals. We see the virtues of God in all the creatures. We see the magnificence of God in all the plants and all things. We see every aspect of the magnificence of God. Like St. Thomas tells us, since God could not make any one thing infinite, he made an infinite number of wonderful things in order that he might show forth his goodness. And God showed forth his goodness. He poured his divinity inside of all creation. So the stab of divinity is everywhere. And that is why St. Leo says the second commandment is like unto it. If we love God, that love must be fruitful. That love must be creative. That love must go out. And if it does not go out, then we love not God. This is said so many times by the saints. And we see the great wisdom of the devil in our times. Making it hard for us. Making it impractical for us to in any way help the poor. Making it impractical for us to do works of charity. And yet the obligation still remains. We have to find ways of doing works of charity. For if we love God, that love is... That second love, which is like unto that love, must come out of us. And it does not. And why does it not? 
because we want to make ourselves secure. And this is one of the temptations that the devil has given, which is why we mention it so many times. The devil is given to the Catholic, the devil is given to the traditionalist, the temptation of self-preservation, the temptation of, of trying to survive the great onslaught of the devil, when this is not the way to survive. This is not the way to survive. The way to survive is to go out against the enemy. The way to survive is to pour oneself out. An athlete becomes strong because he pours himself out. He uses all his muscles and he gets stronger. He gets faster. He gets more impregnable. And so likewise, when it comes to the service of God, we must pour ourselves out. And we don't do it. We don't do it. We must find a way to be serve Christ by bringing others to him. And remember the prayer of those three advisors. They had to replace their wicked advice by a golden earring. They would know they would have to change the way they speak. They have to change their priorities. They can't say, well, now we know Job is good because he got blessed. We thought Job was bad because he stopped being blessed. Whereas when the devil spoke with God and God spoke with the devil... God said, see my servant Job, how he loves me, and nothing can turn his love away from me. And the devil said, I can turn the love away from you. Because when I take away Job's money, and I take away Job's cattle, and I take away Job's wife, and I take away Job's house, and I take away Job's wife, and I take away Job's children, he'll curse you. Let me do it. And God said to the devil, all right, you can do it, but you will see how Job will still stand strong. And though all these harms you do to him, O oh devil, he will never turn against me. And so Job never did. And God allowed the devil to do all these things. Now if God allowed the devil to cause Job so much suffering, he'll never let us suffer like Job did. He did that for holy Job as an example to us. But he might let us suffer a little. And if he does it, for what purpose is it? To test our hearts. To make us prove that we love him. And that love must be fruitful. We have to have a fire and a desire to spread the faith. A fire and a desire to spread the love of God. There must be a fire to help others. When we hear of others' needs, we hear of others' struggles, we hear of others' sufferings, what happens? There should be an automatic need, an automatic necessity, an automatic desire to help them. And this doesn't happen to us. It doesn't happen to us. So it really must change. And remember, when we repent, like the three advisors of Job, or like Gesmos, the wicked thief, our prayers will not be heard. What prayers are going to be heard? The prayers of holy Job. Therefore God says to the three, three advisors, I will not hear your prayers. Therefore don't pray to me. Get Job to pray for thee. And here we see the divine economy. God has willed that there be sisters, that there be brothers, that there be victim souls, that there be souls who pray for others. And if these souls do not pray, the others are damned. And if they do pray, God hears the prayer of these innocent souls. And because of this prayer, they are saved. Like the prayer of St. Teresa of the child Jesus, who prayed for that criminal who was most wicked and who refused to repent. And before he was executed, he repented. Why? Because of the prayer of Teresa not because of the prayer of that wicked criminal. And so it shall be. God has a divine economy. We need to pray for vocations who will offer up their lives for the conversion of sinners, who will turn their hearts to God to pray for the conversion of sinners, who have the spirit of charity inside their heart like holy Job. And Job, who was given bad advice, he could have been very angry at those three men, but he was not. He said, I forgive you, and I will pray to God on your behalf. And because he did, God forgave them. And so we'll pray for that to happen, for these kind of souls to enter into our modern times. And remember, when we have wicked thoughts, when we, have, we turn against God and think the wrong kind of way, and then we go and beg forgiveness, it doesn't mean we're forgiven. We have to change our way of thinking. And ask the Blessed Virgin to teach us how to do that, and to follow the example of Holy Job, and to pray that there be more Jobs in our times who can pray for the conversion of sinners, and God will hear the prayers of these new Jobs, and then many sinners will be saved. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.